Good morning. It's good to see everybody this morning. What a beautiful crowd we have out here. Uh, this must be vacation week. Uh, we, we had uh, 70, 80 kids in here every night for VBS. The, the place was full and it was crazy and crowded and, and all kinds of stuff was going on. Thankfully, no furniture got broke. Uh, but um, uh, we're just excited about that. But the interesting thing is, is we had all kinds of people telling us uh, two or three weeks ago, hey, we're going to be gone after VBS. And we were like, oh, man. So it is kind of interesting. It is a little thin. But we're excited to see you this morning. We're, we're excited to be here. And this is the good thing about it. We are here and God is here. Amen? Amen. So we're, we're just excited. We have something special this morning for us. Uh, we're going to... Uh, Xavier is going to get baptized this morning, so we're real excited about that. So Tim plays our drum, so he's going to go ahead and go up there, and uh, we're going to go ahead and do this thing this morning. So uh, after we have baptism, we're going to have prayer and offering. So we're real excited about what God is doing. Amen? Amen. 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 Praise God. Isn't God good this morning? Come on, that was, that was weak. Isn't God good this morning? Come on. He is worthy to be praised. We had a great time at VBS. Man, God just showed up every night, and I know students and kids were blessed. And I think you're going to be blessed this morning because a young man named Xavier is saying, I want to be baptized. Um, before he comes down, I, <clears throat> right after camp, I just felt this. I, uh, uh, after we went to camp, I text him. One night, and I said, Xavier, it's time to get baptized. And he replied back, I was actually going to text you that, that it's time to get baptized. And I was like, man, this is awesome. So, Xavier, come on down. And we are proud of this young man. I want to take these glasses off. I don't want them to lose them. We'll set those right there. But we are proud of him, and his. we're thankful for him and his family. And, um, you know, God's going to use you. God's going to bless you. And, uh, man, this is your next step in your walk and your profession of faith in Jesus Christ. Um, you want to say anything this morning? I just want to say I'm thankful for everybody for welcoming me into the youth group and this church Come and my on. family. I just want to learn more about God. Amen, amen, amen. <laughs> step forward here. Well, Xavier, I'm so proud of you, and I'm so thankful and honored to be here today with you. And um, I know God's going to use you mightily. And we just want the Holy Spirit to just come in your life and bless you and move upon you. And Xavier, today, this, this represents your profession of faith of Jesus Christ and how you're going to follow him and love him and continue to serve him. And so uh, we're going to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you for Xavier. God, we honor you today. Lord, we just ask that you bless him and move in his life, Lord God, and strengthen him. Lord, be, be his counsel. God, be his discernment. Be his presence and strength that he needs. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Xavier, if you're profession your faith in Jesus Christ, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Amen. 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 <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's just stand and praise God. Come on. Lord, we thank you today. Heavenly Father, we honor you, Lord Jesus. We exalt you on high, Lord God. And we just ask, Lord, that you be with us in our service, Lord God, and strengthen us, each and every one of us. Thank you, Lord God. And Jesus, Jesus, we pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus. God, we worship your name, Lord God. Praise your name, Lord God. Praise we worship your name, God. We worship your name. Yes, God, we worship your name. We worship your name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. We're just going to go to the Lord in prayer this morning as we start our service. And um, Jonah Hernandez, uh, we had talked with Claudia uh, a couple of days ago. Back at the very beginning of the week, Jonah had surgery and on his tonsils. Uh, it was a lot more intense surgery than what they thought. He had 16, st he had 16 stitches in his throat. Um, he has uh, had some problems this week. So we want to pray over Jonah this morning. 
Uh, my wife Sherry is not here this morning. She is, she's been sick about the last three or four days, and uh, uh, she woke up this morning and could barely talk, and when I left, she was doing worse uh, than when she woke up. So we want to pray for Sherry. Um, I'm just trusting and believing God for her, uh, just God to heal her and just bring health into her life. So if you would just help me to pray for them. And um, if you have an unspoken request this morning, would you just signify that with an uplifted hand? I know that God knows those needs. Just pray with me this morning, if you will. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the good things that you do. God, we just acknowledge who you are. We come today and we declare that you are God, that you are our help, that you are our hope, that you are our peace, our joy, our strength. God, Lord, we thank you for what you do. We thank you for who you are, God. And Lord, we declare your greatness this day, God. We come and we celebrate who you are. We celebrate, God, that you have that you have set the sun and the stars and the moon all in their place, God. Lord, you spun this little planet. And God, Lord, you have given us strength, God, to go from day to day, God. In the days of struggle, God, Lord, you are our help. And we thank you for that. Lord, we lift up Jonah this morning. We pray over Jonah Hernandez this morning. God, that you would touch him and just minister to him, God. Let him feel your touch. God, we ask this morning that you would bring complete healing into this young man's life. Wholeness, God, into his life. I pray over my wife, Sherry. God, that you would touch her and bring healing and, and wholeness into her life. Oh, God, that you would remove this virus, oh, God. And, God, we just honor you and worship you, God. Lord, we pray this morning over every home that's represented in this church. God, we pray, oh, God, over each one that's, that may be sick this morning. God, whatever the need is, God, whether it's financial, whether it's health, where it's just marital or whatever it may be, God, this morning, right now, God, we lay it at your feet and we believe in who you are. And God, we thank you for what you're doing, God. We declare your greatness, God, and we worship you this day and we honor you. And it's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen and amen. Our ushers are going to come to service this morning. Father, bless this offering in the name of Jesus. Amen. waiting on our drummer here but uh, I thought I'd read something to you I just feel led to bring forth I was debating on whether I should but you know how God is when he says you need to do it you need to do it so anyway it's kind of this is out of Psalms 107 verses 1 through 9 uh, oh give thanks unto the Lord for he is good for his mercy endureth forever let the redeemed of the Lord say so whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy and and gathered them out of the lands from the east, from the west, from the north, and from the south. They wandered in the wilderness in a solitary way. They found no city to dwell in. Obviously, these people were miserable, right? The Israelites, that's who we're referring to here. Um, verse 5, hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted. But then catch this part. Number 6, verse 6, then they cried unto the Lord. You notice, then they cried unto the Lord. They didn't cry to Obama. <laughs> they didn't cry to Biden. They didn't cry to Trump. They didn't cry to nobody else. They cried unto the Lord uh, in their trouble. And he delivered them out of their distresses. And he led them forth by the right hand. Sorry, phone's acting silly here. And he led them forth out of the right hand, forth by the right hand, that they might go to a city of habitation. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he satisfies the longing soul and filleth the hungry soul with goodness. That's our God. Amen. That sounds like a God that we should be willing to worship, lift our hands and praise, you know, if you're able to. Um, that's what God wants us to do. That's why we're here, to worship him in spirit and in truth. And so, as you can see, we're kind of we're lacking a few people here musician-wise, but that's all right because God's still going to move. He's going to use what is available today and do what we can. I'm a little nervous, as you can probably tell, because I hadn't led worship and I couldn't tell you how long. 
much less with an acoustic guitar. So anyway, uh, I just encourage you to bless the Lord, and he will definitely bless you. He will bless us. Let's just lift up his name, praise him. I'm, like I said, I'm waiting on my drummer to get in here, but he'll be in here in just a minute. Um, he's coming. Look at Let's give Brother Tim a hand. There he is. <laughs> God is good and greatly to be praised. Jesus, lover of 
Living 
I'm amazed by you. Lord, I'm amazed by you. Lord, I'm amazed by you. And how you love me. Lord, I'm amazed. Lord, I'm a 
thank you, Father, for who you are. Yes, I thank you, Father, for who you are. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God, you have been so good to me. 
And I declare your greatness this day. I declare your greatness. God, I declare that I am dependent upon you. Everything in this world is, is subject to change. But you. Oh, I thank you, God, that you never change. I thank you that you never leave us nor forsake us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Let's give the Lord a hand this morning. Oh, Father, we worship your name. Amen. You may be seated. I want to say thank you to our worship team this morning. Man, these guys did great. Josh, our worship pastor, is gone. Him and his family are going to Texas this week. And uh, so we knew they would be gone. And so we're so thankful that Roy... Uh, Just stepped up and did such a great job this morning. I want to just say thank you to Roy this morning. Uh, One of our other guitarists, Jerry, is out this morning, so uh, we um, we knew that he was going to be gone. They're they're out of town, so there's all kinds of people gone. I just want to say thank you uh, once again to all those who came and worked VBS and helped, and those who sent your kids and all kinds of good stuff. We just had a had a house full and it was crazy at times we punctured the big beach ball twice we patched it twice it 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 left the um it left the sanctuary uh holding air so we're excited about that we're excited all kinds of great things happened but we're excited that there were lives changed and the word was spoken the i just want to say that the the um the bible lesson uh, we're Starlene. They started the Bible lesson was so good every night, and she, they did such a great job. Tim helped us. Uh, just Sherry was was uh, sick off and on, and she just um, it was kind of funny. Sherry about two days into it, she said, "I'm sick. I don't know what's going on." And um, so we had been at camp the week before, and she said, "I'm afraid that while I was at camp, I picked up COVID," and I was like, "Oh, please don't say that in front of people, you know, because everybody's going to get tore up." And uh, so she did a COVID test. It was negative. And we went a couple more days. And she was like, I'm still sick. And in the middle of the night, she took another COVID test. And it was negative. And, she, and I told her, I said, I think you want it. You seem like you. <laughs> but, um, but Sherry, this morning, she's just, she's just really, her throat's just really hurting. And I told her, I said, listen, you've been at church all week. Just, man, take the day off. We're good. Uh, Everything is good, so uh, we're excited to be here this morning. I want to take just a minute before I start my message. Uh, I'm going to speak out of Job again this morning. uh, The last two weeks, I read through the book of Job and spent a couple weeks in Job, and um, it is a it's a real interesting book. I actually like reading the book of Job. There's I hear people comment, you know, that Job is confusing in it. It just kind of goes on and on, and there's just a lot of nonsense in it and things like that. But the interesting thing about the book is it, it, it's, it's real life. Um, the book of Job is real life, and, and, and it's about tragedy, and it's about God walking through us and tragedy with, you know, through the tragedy. But I want to stop just for a minute and say something. I, I, I felt like I should have said something last week. I didn't. I want to just stop and say something about Roe v. Wade. Um, we have not, uh, this, um, I, I, we're not going to do a discussion this morning, uh, but um, I do want to say, I do want to just say a couple of things about Roe v. Wade. Um, I, I, heard the, I heard the president uh, give a speech about this, and the interesting thing, that, the thing that, that concerned me so much, one, he says he's a Christian, and I'm concerned about that because his, his motivation for, for wanting to undo this is votes. And our motivation, the church, our motivation to stop this is not votes. This is not for the church. This has absolutely nothing to do with political power. It has nothing to do with political power. It has, it has everything to do that we believe that the Scripture says that God has sanctified life and that no man has the authority to take life, even if life is six weeks old in your womb. And I understand that that people are saying, well, this is in my body, but at the same time, we we are creatures of God. We are created of God. We are from Him. And... When, when he has given us the ability, when he has given an 
a man and a woman the responsibility to create life, it's, we do not have the authority to take back that life. Now, let me, let me say this. It's real interesting because the president wanted to talk about rape and incest. When you go through, you can go through every state in the United States, and when they come into the abortion clinic and they say why they did the abortion, there is no pressure on them. Most of the time, there's nobody in the room with them but the, but the nurse. When they come in and they, they declare why they do that, somewhere between 97 to 98% of the people say the reason why they're getting the abortion is because I don't want it. That's, that's not what the church says. That's not what the president says. That's not what my Uncle George says. That's not what my cousin Carl says. But what the, the people say when they come in to get the abortion. So I, I find it interesting that what they want to say, and, and we do feel sorry for people. If you've ever known anybody who has been raped, that is an absolute tragedy. It's, it's, it's a... It's a it's a life-changing experience. It alters people's lives. It's a little bit like a living murder. Uh, it's, it, if anybody's ever been through a divorce, a divorce is a living death. Uh, you go through a divorce and the person you know, who left you and, and they're happy on the other side of the town with Sally and you're over here <laughs> by yourself you know, with two kids. And uh, they're drinking and having fun, you know, and they're over there having a good time. And there is something so wrong about that. And you have to, you have to figure out how to do this thing. But I, I find that so interesting that the, the excuse to do abortion is because of rape. And the truth of it is, even though that does happen, but the percentage is so small, most states... Hear this because the president misspoke on this. Most states give that. If you can prove that it's rape, they will give you that abortion. They'll, they'll, they'll allow that to happen. There's states that will allow that to happen. And they were saying that the way they said it was, they're not letting, you, they're not, they're not letting anybody do this. They're wanting to take over our country and, and all this stuff. I want to say this, God's rule over rules man's rules and we have to be very careful when our country says we don't care what the bible says we don't care what god says what what we want is what we want then i believe we get in trouble all right we're going to move on we're going to talk about job this morning um but i'm i'm, I'm just bothered that this is a political issue and it needs to be an, a moral and ethical issue not a political issue. If it's about votes, then people were in trouble. Um, and I think, too, and I, I'm, I'm moving on, but I, I think we need, we need the right numbers and not play on people's emotions. Moving on. Job chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. I want to talk this morning about Job's answer. This is Job's answer. Job gets an answer. You ever, you ever talked with somebody? You ever been somewhere and you tried to get an answer from somebody and you couldn't get an answer? You ever had your children to do something wrong and you walked into the room and you said, who did this? And they all, they all just sat there and just kind of looked at each other and they were like, don't say anything. You know, the best thing we can do is not talk. And here Job through this entire book, Job gets an answer at the very end of the book. God, God himself responds to Job and he confirms that Job is a righteous man and that Job is a good man. And so I want to say this morning that this is a little bit like our story because we all, somewhere in life, we're all going to go through some kind of tragedy and maybe not to the extent of what Job went through but the truth of it is, is, is God is still with Job at the end of the book just as much as he was with him at the beginning of the book. So I want to tell you that, that God is not going to leave you. He's going to walk with you. Verse 1 says this, 
So I want to I just start off by saying who Job was and who he is. And verse 1 and verse 2 says this, There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. Every now and then you hear it on TV, they say Job. And, um, so, and that's because there's a lot of jobs in our country right now. And, and that man was blameless and upright. This is what the Bible says about Job. This is what God says about Job. In the beginning of the book, this is what God says about Job. That he is blameless and upright. And he is one who feared God and shunned evil. Meaning that when things came against him that were evil, Job refused to take part in it. Even when he was pressured and even when he was... Even, you ever been in that situation where you're out with three or four friends and you know something's not right and you are the only one in the group who does have some concern about what's going on? You're the only one in the group and everybody else is like, oh, there's nothing wrong, that's fine, this is good, there's nothing wrong with that. No, Job was the guy that when something was wrong, Job said, guys, I can't do this. I can't, I can't sit here and not say anything. There's something not right with what's going on, and I have to say something about it. So he was a man who was upright, blameless, and he feared God, and he shunned evil. Meaning, when it says that he feared God, that he had reverence for God, that he reverenced God and believed in who God was, and this man had a good relationship with God. Verse 2 says this, and seven sons and three daughters were born to him. So we know that Job had a big family and that he was a normal person in that sense that he had done all these good things. But then we see that the devil comes into the story and the devil is given permission to destroy all that Job has. And the devil comes into the story. And the interesting thing is, the devil is the accuser. And he comes into the story and he wants to accuse somebody. He wants to find somebody that he can call some kind of trouble in their life. You ever known anybody like that? That, that they, they wanted to cause a little trouble? It's like if something wasn't going on, if there wasn't some kind of problem, they weren't happy? Job had to deal with the devil. And so the devil come in... To be, the devil comes before God and he says, hey man, what's going on? And God says, hey, have you, and, and this is the crazy thing about the story, God says to, Job, to the devil, he says, have you considered my servant Job? And it's Job here, Job didn't sign up for this. It wasn't Job who said, hey, I'll, I'll sign up for it. I'll, I'll take the, you can destroy everything I have and take everything I have and make me a, nervous wreck but the devil gets permission to to ruin and to destroy all that job has then the book really starts that's just in the first couple of chapters and then his friends show up this is when the book gets real good because for the next 36 chapters job and his friends dialogue and it just goes back and forth and back and forth and and job kind of says something and his friends say something and, and it just goes back and forth and it gets very long. But here's what I'm telling you is that there's actually some really good stuff in the book because it shows us, it reminds us over and over and over that if we are faithful to God, that God will be faithful to us. And God, here's what I like about the book. God says, have you considered my servant Job? The devil's like, wow, I can do this. And then the devil says, well, you've got a hedge around him. You've got protection on him. You, you have your hand on him, your favor's on him, and I can't get to him. I like that. And then God says, okay, I'm giving you authority right now to do anything that you want. Except don't harm him in the beginning. Later that changes and, and he actually, Job actually goes through some physical problems. So the devil goes and he takes everything that he has. He kind of destroys everything that he has and he brings Job down to nothing. 
And then this is where Job's friends show up. So Job chapter 4, verse 8 through 9, I want to read this. Job chapter 4, verses 8 through 9. We'll read two verses here. <clears throat> this is talking about his friends. Even as I have seen, this is one of his friends talking to him, those who plow iniquity, also sow trouble, reap the same. So what did his friend say to him? So his friend is talking to Job, and he said, I'm telling you, you have sowed some trouble, and you have plowed iniquity. You've done some stuff wrong in your life. And basically, he uses that, that, that term in the Scripture, the, the thought in Scripture about what you sow is what you reap, right? That's what he says. And verse 9 says this, By the blast of God, they perish. Because you've done wrong, God has God has come against you and he has spoke against you. And by the breath of his anger, they are consumed. And that's what his friends have to say about him. Wow, great friends, huh? Anybody need some good friends? I, there's four of them in Job that will, really, that will really bring you comfort when you go through trouble. <clears throat> Here's the interesting thing. Job's friends, this is what they say. First, they say that you've sinned. If you have trouble in your life, you've sinned. How many of us know that we, I would think that everybody in this room, somewhere in your life, you have went through something and you did not deserve it. You did not sin. You did not, there was no iniquity in your life. There was no, you weren't asking for it. You weren't doing anything. But one of the things that we know is that we live in a broken world. We live in a broken world. We live in a world where things are wrong and, and things are, are out of shape and things are not in balance and there's all kinds of problems and things. And the issue is, is sometimes we get some of that bad stuff because it rains on the just and the unjust. And just because the other day somebody called me here in the church and they said, Pastor, it hadn't rained here at my house in two weeks. Somebody's not paying their tithe. Of course, they're joking, you know. They're like, somebody's not paying their tithe. We need to go through the church and make sure everybody's paying their tithe. It's not raining. And then there was somebody else said something about that the, they, they needed to give some money to the pastor or something. I, I don't know if I've heard that one. And, and it was kind of funny, you know, that they were kind of talking about that. And, and I said, I think. There's a cold front that hadn't moved through, I think the problem is. <laughs> but we go through dry seasons. And here's the thing it is, there's people that live here in this town that have done terrible things that have never gotten caught. And you know what? They got the same rain that I got. They got the same rain that you got. This is the world that we live in. And Job's friend, come, they come to him and they say, Job, you have sinned. And because you have problems is because you've done wrong, is what they're saying. You're getting exactly what you deserve, Job. But the book of Job teaches us that you're not getting what you deserve. No, it's revealing that we live in a broken world. They keep saying over and over, Job, you're not living right. You're not living right. Just because something goes wrong doesn't mean that you're not living it. Now, the truth... Let me just say this, if we're not living right, eventually our sins will find us out. We know that, that our sins will run us down, that justice will eventually be served. But at the same time, there are days where we do not do anything and things go wrong. And this is another thing that they say over and over is that you have lost God's favor. They tell Job over and over, you have lost God's favor. Do you have anybody wanting to tell you that? That you have lost God's favor. I just don't know. Things just aren't really going that good. Well, you've lost God's favor. God's not happy with you. And the, here's what we do. Is every day in our life, we just go before God and I say, God, if there's anything in my life, help me to see that. God, help me to see if there's anything in my life that needs to be changed. God, help me to see that I want to I want to be in right standing with you. I want to be in right standing with you. But the interesting thing is we read here in the very beginning of Job, God says that he's upright and just. That's what God says about him. 
And it's, it's here, his friends say, no, you've lost God's favor. God has taken his hand off of you. I want to tell somebody this morning, just because things are not going right in your life does not mean that God's favor is off of you. It may mean that you live in a broken world. So what do we do? We press forward. Job had the option of quitting every day. Every hour of the day, Job had the option of quitting. Job could have quit at any time he wanted. But what Job did was Job said, I am trusting God. Toward the beginning of the book, Job's wife says, Wow, Job, things are really falling apart. What you need to do is just curse God and die. So his friends tell him, going the wrong way, Job. His wife's telling him it's going the wrong way. And the, the truth of it is we assume that this is what has happened. We assume that this is what has happened. But Job, all through the book, continually says, I feel that I have lived a righteous life. Now, he, he goes back and forth and, and, and talks about a lot of different things, but the core of his message is, I don't think that I have broken any rules. And sometimes our view of ourselves sometimes can be a little skewed. It can be a little off sometimes. I want us to look at Job chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. Verse 9 says, Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Do you still hold fast? Do you still want to hold on to your integrity, Job? So her answer is, Curse God and die. Just get, just, <clears throat> her answer is, You know the horse is going to die. The horse has a broken leg. What the horse is going to do is the horse is going, this is, this is, why we, this is why we shoot horses. I've, I've raised horses, and we've had to put a few horses down, and this is what happens is when a horse, if a horse breaks a leg, horses cannot live laying down. They can't do it. They die. They die. They, they, their heart is made in such a way that they have to be standing up. They, they, don't, they do not spend very much of their time laying down. They'll lay down for about 30, 40 minutes, a few times a week, maybe. It kind of varies, but they, they do not lay down very much. If a horse lays down too long, it will die. The horse can, can have absolutely nothing wrong with it. If it lays down too long, it'll die. So when a horse breaks its leg, the problem is, is the horse has to stand on the leg, and the leg will never heal. Because the horse is continually putting pressure on the leg, it continually moves the bone and the bone will not heal. And so what happens is we put the horse out of its misery because what's going to happen is the horse is going to walk around, that leg is going to swell up, it's going to get infected, the infection is going to eventually go deeper into the body and it's going to kill it. So do we kill the horse today or do we let it live for a week and a half and let it suffer. And so Job's wife here is saying, shoot the horse. Just shoot the horse. That's what Job's wife is 